Um, why don't we go ahead and introduce the vegetable of the day. This one is called jicama. For my visual learners, jicama. Also called yam bean, Mexican turnip, uh, Mexican yam bean. There's a bunch of names for this. Um, this is also now used um, not quite glo as globally as tamarind that we talked about last week, um, but it's used in a lot of cultures in food. But it did originate in, uh, in Mexico and Central America. Um, there's something about China and then Central America, Mexico, where there's just this like, I don't know, hotbed of agricultural development. Those cultures really figured out um, how to find food in the environment and develop it through agriculture to become kind of bigger and more delicious in the case of like Mexico, how they picked teosinte, which is this tiny little head of what we now call corn that's this big. They took teosinte, which is this little grass uh, seed, and they grew it bigger and bigger and bigger until now we have this like a delicious, crunchy, sweet corn that we know. That's an example of, um, of that sort of development of agriculture. So this is called a jicama, and um, it's a delicious, crunchy treat. Uh, you can cook it, you can eat it raw, and um, this is what it looks like when it's all broken down. And we're going to talk about how to do that, actually. So for my seeds kids who already have their um, delicious little treat, give it a try. It's like sweet, and watery, and crispy, and wonderful. Um, this is sort of like, you know, chayote the first week where we talked about, like the tofu of vegetables. This absorbs the flavor of other things. So while this is, you know, it's sweet, but it's about as flavor complex as a potato. It doesn't, it doesn't have a ton of flavor, but it's very fibrous and crisp. And so you can actually um, marinate this in like lemon juice and chili. Um, you can do, I love like to marinate this in a little bit of orange juice and zest with a little bit of white vinegar and, um, and mint or cilantro. That's excellent. It's good to have it in the fridge marinating in something because then when you're outside and you're sweating and it's hot and you come inside, sometimes when you're hungry, when it's hot, you don't want to eat anything heavy. This is wonderful. This is a wonderful thing to eat when it's, when it's hot outside. I grew up eating this, um, in Arizona. Uh, they used to sell this cut up with, um, uh, some watermelon, mango, um, all kinds of different fruits in a cup and you'd buy it and they would squeeze lemon on it and then put hot chili and salt. And I could eat those all the time. There's this little taco shop called Pico de Gallo on South Sticks in Tucson. And I ate it ever since I was a little kid. And when I go back to visit, that's one of the places I stop to get that. It's just a taste of my childhood. Um, so I highly recommend it. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about sort of uh, how this grows. Um, this guy, when you put it in the ground, you'll get some that get this big and some of them are this big. This is about the size of a potato. These actually can get as big as 30 pounds. This one's probably two and a half to three pounds because it's real heavy and full of water, but they can get really massive, just not here because this is a tropical vegetable and it's a, it's a root, it's a tuber um, that grows under the ground. And in tropical environments, in warm environments near the equator where it never gets cold, uh, they might have a rainy season, but it never freezes. This grows as a perennial. It'll come back year after year. Um, but here in North Carolina, you can grow it, but you're only really going to get maybe you can get them this big, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, you can get real small ones if you only have five months of frost free. We have about eight, nine months of frost free. So you frost free weather. So you can get them about this big um, and also some little ones. Um, and even, it doesn't matter if they're this big or this big, they're equally delicious, which is rare. Usually a beet, like if you get a beet that's this big, it's like tender and lovely. Or if you get, but if you get one this big, it's like kind of earthy and hard and woody. Um, that's not the case with a jicama. They're pretty much delicious and delectable no matter what size they are. So um, let's talk a little bit about the nutrition of this. Now, a lot of people are very much into low carb diets or if someone is pre-diabetic or diabetic and they're craving potatoes, this is a great thing because you can cook it. So you can make French fries out of this. A lot of people will bake these. Um, you coat them in a little bit of oil and spices, slice them up like little French fries like this. And then you can bake them with a little bit of oil on them. And it'll give you, especially if you bake them on a rack, like a, a sheet pan with a rack in it, it allows the heat to really dry them out a little bit. So they have a crispy texture on the outside. And they're really full of fiber. They have a lot less calories and a lot less carbohydrates 
than um, the potatoes do. So this is a great food, like a transitional food um, for people who are trying to get on to, to eat a lot less carbohydrates as to not spike their blood sugar. Because a lot of times when someone's pre-diabetic or diabetic, they're told not to eat regular white potatoes to, uh, to uh, avoid them or, or uh, curtail them in their diet. This is a great substitute. You can put it in soups, you can grill it, um, you can grate it up into a slaw. There's like a million different ways that you can use this vegetable. So let's talk about why um, this is good for you. So there are lots of different kinds of fiber and we won't go deeply into fiber on this. That'll be a different, uh, we'll, we'll go sort of deeper into fiber because there's so many different kinds of fiber and it's kind of endlessly interesting. I know it sounds like it'd be boring, but I promise it's pretty interesting. So one of the fibers that are rare in nature in our fruit and vegetable uh, consumption is inulin. It's a fiber. Okay, so you can find this in chicory, uh, you can find it in bananas, you can find it in onions and garlic, but not too many more other things. And what this does is it's, it's important that we have um, fiber, we've talked about that before to keep you regular so that you're using the restroom every day, because if you're not, that's a problem. Um, but it also feeds your, your microbiome. So um, we've said it before that, uh, you know, for every cell of your body, there are 10 other cells in, on, and around you that are living independently of you, but working with you to keep you alive. If you totally sanitized yourself and took away your microbiome, you wouldn't survive. Um, you're a community of cells. You're your own DNA, but you also have other things depending on you and feeding you. And those are called probiotics. That's what we call them when they're in our intestines, okay? Probiotics. And as you can see, I'm a terrible artist that looks like a sprinkled donut, but that's actually, for my visual learners, my, uh, my version of a probiotic cell inside of your intestines. And then inulin is a prebiotic. That's the food for these guys. So some examples of probiotics is if you've ever had, um, if you've ever had uh, like yogurt and you look on the side of it, on the label, it'll say live active cultures. Those are probiotics. When you eat those bacteria, they live in your immune, they live in your uh, digestive system and they actually help break down your food. They allow you to absorb more minerals. Um, there's lots of ways that having a really high di uh, healthy digestive system has more to do with probiotics than you know. Um, it's a big part of your immune system as well. If you have a healthy microbiome of probiotics in your digestive system, then uh, you're gonna be able to fight off infections easier. You're gonna be able to absorb more of your nutrients from your food. And all of those little spots that these guys are living, they're kind of hanging out on your intestinal wall, if those are filled with really good guys fighting for you and you eat something bad, um, you're gonna have a lot less of a chance of anything colonizing or making you ill because these guys are fighting for your survival every day and their own. And so to feed them, we feed them prebiotics and that's what inulin is. There's lots of other fibers that fall in this category too, but inulin is rare and it's very, very uh, nutritious for them. So when you eat jicama, you get a lot of inulin. Um, and also when you eat inulin, fiber has no calories. So it makes you feel really full, but it feeds your little immune system in there, your probiotics. And then um, you don't actually absorb any calories from it. So um, it's actually very beneficial uh, for, to keep a healthy weight and to have a healthy immune system. So without further ado, I'm adding a little element to this. Cause I mean, if you pick this up in the grocery store, this is intimidating. Um, when you buy it in the grocery store, you can get this at a Harris Teeter or a, sometimes Food Lion has it. And if you buy it in a, in a grocery store that doesn't sell a lot of these, they'll be waxed. Um, and that's so they don't dry out because they're only buying like maybe a half a case of them at a time and they'll be expensive, like $2 a pound. But if you go to either uh, an Asian grocery store or especially a Latinx grocery store um, like Food World or anywhere that's got a Latin section, you're gonna find these really cheap, like $60, I mean, 60 cents a pound, maybe a dollar a pound and they won't be waxed because they go through them a lot faster. When you select these, they should be nice and firm like a potato. If you pick one up and it's gushy anywhere or soft, 
don't buy it. It's not worth it. It won't be good inside. Um, it won't taste good. And it'll be, it just shows that it's old and it's been sitting there. Never be afraid to ask your produce person, Hey, do you have a case of these in the back? I do it all the time. If I look at the broccoli, if I'm making something with broccoli or spinach or whatever, um, and I want to buy that vegetable and it doesn't look so good. I just go to the double doors where the, you know, the people are, have the walk-ins in the back with all the vegetables. And I ask them to bring me out a fresh case and they do it all the time. If they have it, they'll bring it to you. So let me show you how to break this down, okay? I would normally be doing this kind of class in the food lab, but I have to be docked and have my computer here because otherwise the bandwidth is not as good if I'm um, on, on, uh, on the Wi-Fi. So um, we're sitting in my, in my office doing this. Okay, ready? <laughs> Bringing the kitchen to you. Okay, so you wanna make sure to have a really sharp knife. A sharp knife is a safe knife, okay? If you have a dull knife and you're working with a big vegetable like this, it could be really bad because you have to force really hard. You want the food to be, to, you want the knife to work for you. So you not want a nice sharp edge. Um, and then if you're nervous, you can get yourself one of these here cut gloves. Um, this one's actually for kids that we use to teach people knife skills here at the Cooperative Extension Office. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put it on so I'm representing good practices so that people don't feel nervous. Always put it on your non-dominant hand. That's the one that's in danger, okay? I know a lot of my seeds kids out there, you have excellent knife skills. I've seen you work it. I'm proud of you. Um, for adults that are, uh, adults or kids, or if you have a little kid in your family that wants to help grate vegetables or something, if they're grating, have them put it on their dominant hand. And then they can work in the kitchen and you don't have to worry about them hurting themselves. So what we're going to do first is we're going to cut the top and the bottom off. This just gives us a little surface to work with, okay? Then we're gonna get that out of the way. And then if you see, if you pull this back, it's really fibrous under there. We gotta take that off. Now I have a peeler here, but a peeler is for thin skins like potatoes and um, carrots and things like that. It will literally not cut it on this. You will wear yourself out. So I recommend just running your knife around, cutting about an eighth of an inch down and just uh, remove the skin like so all the way around like this and you just keep cutting 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 and then what we're going to do is flip it over so you've got the other side and then you can kind of just peel these guys back and do the same thing on this side what's nice about these is they don't oxidize and turn brown like potatoes do so but if you come into a brown spot or something, just cut it out and it's perfectly fine. Okay, that's a little problem area. We'll leave that alone. So I'm just gonna keep cutting. Always keep your hand up above. Don't cut like this and put your hand in the way. Gotta be safe. When COVID is over, you can come and see me and we can do in-person knife skills classes. It's one of the best um, skills you can have in the kitchen. It's the most fundamental. Before you learn how to cook even, you should learn knife skills because if you don't have knife skills, pre-made salads are very expensive. Okay, so now I'm just gonna take some slices like so. Now, if I was gonna grill it, I would stick it on the grill just like that. If I'm gonna make fries out of it, I'm gonna stack these little bad boys like that and I'm gonna cut like so and I've got French fries. If I wanted to put this in a stew or a soup, I would, or even a salad, I would cut it across this way and I've got cubes. So that's how you break down a jicama. Um, you will get a little workout doing this, but okay. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> a little, a little uh, practice there. So I had to show you how to do that because I don't like to um, give you information without empowering you to actually experience these kinds of vegetables. So that's, for, oh, one last thing I wanted to tell you about this plant. If you want to grow this plant, you absolutely can in North Carolina, you can get the seeds for it, but just beware if you're growing it around small children, this, the, this is edible, but that's the only part. The rest of it's poisonous. It has rotenone and all of the sprouts and seeds and all of that are poisonous. Now I doubt somebody's going to make a salad out of it because, oh my gosh, the Usually when a, a plant is toxic, it's very bitter, um, but still just be careful. Also, don't grow it around a fish pond because rotenone is what they use as, um, uh, as a, a 
a sort of a pesticide for fish. So um, just keep that in mind. But you know, as long as you're careful, it's fine. Tomato plants are also uh, toxic, not quite as toxic as this, but kids are not just gonna start munching on um, tomato leaves. They're super, super bitter and they smell terrible. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure to tell you that for safety. And, um, and then I'll just open it up for questions about jicama or anything else. Okay, so I think this you answered this, but you might want to speak to a little more. This is a great question. Um, is it supposed to be cooked? I ate it raw and it tasted weird, LOL. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the thing is, is when it's, when it's by itself, it's like kind of not that interesting. Um, it's like a carrot stick. Like a carrot stick has way more flavor. Um, but or even like a cucumber, like people like cucumbers, but usually they're in something. So um, it does taste weird. It's kind of like sweet and bland a little bit, but if you marinate it in something like a salad, like it, even if you dip it in your favorite dressing, it's gonna taste completely different. Um, but if you marinate it in something like I was talking about like citrus or your favorite vinegar, um, or even if you got your favorite salad dressing and just put it on, especially if it's like a vinaigrette, like a balsamic vinaigrette or um, Italian dressing, and you cut this up and just squirted Italian dressing all over it and let it sit for like a day in the refrigerator. It's a really delicious, refreshing treat. And every bite will be like eating dressing because it absorbs the flavor. So yeah, you can definitely cook it though. You can absolutely, you can saute it, grill it. Um, grating it up into slaw is one of my favorite ways, but if you like chili and lime, whew, so good. Um, you can also cut it up. Oh, one of my favorite salads is actually half jicama, half pineapple, lime juice and zest, and uh and mint and it's amazing that is like a really wonderful salad it goes really good with citrus things like that kind of bland. that's good um so we have a comment um it kind of looks like a coconut and yeah oh you want to keep going <laughs> well, the seeds kids like i wanted so bad to buy coconuts for you guys this week but it's a lot to break one of those down. So um, I think we'll have to do a coconut because I don't think that people, coconuts are fascinating. It does look like a coconut. It's as heavy as a coconut, but um, I'm gonna have to work out doing a coconut for my seeds kids because it is so fun. It requires tools. Um, I'll probably have to break it down ahead of time and just give you the pieces because um, I think it would be a challenge for you to break a coconut. Um, it requires like a screwdriver and a hammer, um, but it's still a good thing to know because if you're in the tropics, it's clean water and food in the same spot. So, uh, but yeah, it does look like a coconut. Awesome. Um, so the next is a really interesting question too. Mine seem to be a little bitter. Are there any flavor variations? Yes. So normally the ones that are like, I noticed this one is a little bit kind of sweeter with a little bit more bitter. I, I do notice that. Um, sometimes if you get them super fresh, when they're not waxed, uh, they don't have that little bit of bitter. There are two varieties. One that's like the water sap variety, which is this variety. And then there's a milk sap variety that's kind of more elongated. Um, and those ones, if you're like in a place where they grow, you can buy the seeds for them and grow them yourself. Um, or like if you're in a place that grows a lot of jicama, you can find them there, but they're not usually shipped for the international market um, like the water sap varieties are. So they all very, they all generally taste the same, um, but the fresher they are, uh, the better they're gonna taste, just like pretty much anything. Um, so I just recommend cooking it if, it if it doesn't taste great, like add something else to it, because this is kind of bland. It's, it's, not, it's not too interesting, it's, but it's such a great ingredient in other things, is, is my opinion of it. Well, sort of like the chayote during the first week, it's like this taste, but like not as sweet and kind of grassy. It doesn't have a lot of taste. You have to add it to other stuff. And it's, you know, it's very beneficial to eat, which is why we do it. Um, and this is another great question. So I think this is around growing the plant. Um, mm -hmm. Would it look like a potato plant when it's growing? No, no, great question. Potatoes um, kind of grow, actually it would look kind of more like a sweet potato vine because it's, it's a long vine and it, it vines out in different areas. It climbs on a trellis and, or it can vine over the ground as well, but it can climb on a trellis and it puts off beans. So it'll put off these beans. It's a legume, a leguminous plant, like we've talked about before, it affixes nitrogen in the soil. Um, but the beans are poisonous, you wouldn't eat them. But you can use the bean 
to plant for the next year. So, um, but potatoes like traditional white potatoes, um, they're in the tomato and pepper family. And so their leaves literally look more like, um, not quite like tomato plants because tomatoes can be vines or bushes, um, but potatoes are kind of bushy. And you can tell that tomatoes and potatoes are related because if you get some of the heirloom varieties of tomatoes, Look them up. They'll be. They'll say potato leaf variety, and it it doesn't look like a regular tomato leaf. It looks like the leaf of a potato. So um, they kind of grow in like a bush habit. Um, regular potatoes do, and then you continue to hill up around the um, the vines, and then or the bush, and more potatoes are produced. That's not how jicama works. Jicama is just this long, long, long vine. You plant them kind of close together, and they put off a, a couple few tubers a piece, and and that's it. So there, it's different. So this is a question you're going to have to help me with, Sherilyn. Um, you say it's a legume, but is it a fabacia? Would that be how you say that word? No, it's not a fabacia. A a fabacia. <laughs> um, it's a rhizo. I'm going to look it up because I just read it. A pacio. I, I'll. I'll actually look it up for you because um, it's it's not a it's not a fabacia, but it does create a bean. All right, and then another comment. I think I've only seen the long ones in the store. Mm -hmm. And another question, is it always white on the inside? Yes, I don't know of any other variety that creates like a red one or a purple one like potatoes do. Um, Every one I've ever seen, wherever I've traveled, wherever I shopped, it always looks some semblance of this. Um, I think they taste better when they're not waxed. I mean, the, the wax is safe. It's just a food safe wax, but um, I think I think they're better. You can tell they're fresher when they're not waxed because they're like firm and beautiful. They're dry. They're not shiny like this. They don't have this shine on them. They look more like a, like a potato. So um, yeah. Great. Um, I just want to encourage our listeners to always to raise their hands too. I don't have to be the only one who speaks. Um, so if you want to ask your question by raising your hand, please do. Um, I think that may be all the questions about this particular, is it a vegetable, Sherilyn? Am I saying yes, that right? Yes, great question. So I think everything that we've had up to this point has been a fruit, botanically speaking, because things that have seeds in them, whether it's a pit, which is in the, you know, almond family, peach family, cherry family, those are all pits. Um, and so technically that's a droop, but it's still in the family of fruit. Berries are fruits. Uh, tomatoes are technically a berry. They're a fruit. They have a seed inside. Um, those are all fruits. Uh, but this is the vegetative part of the plant. If it's a root, a rhizome, a shoot, a stem, those are all true vegetables. It's a vegetative portion of the plant. Even though this plant creates a fruit, which is that bean that I was talking about, green beans are even technically a fruit. They're a seed pod. Um, but you know, the only thing that people say is a vegetable that's not really a vegetable, it's a grain, is corn. Corn is not a vegetable. Corn is this, almost the same as bread. It's a, it's a grain. That's a little bit different. So it's, it's not a vegetable and it's not a fruit. It's a grain. It's a totally different class of plants. Um, but this is truly a vegetable because it's, um, part of, it's part of the plant that does not have really anything to do with the reproduction. Awesome, thank you. So I think that was the last question about that particular vegetable. Um, we do have some other questions. Um, the question that I know you've been waiting for, what should we be planting right now, particularly when it's so hot? Oh, okay. So some people, you know, on the, uh, on the calendars right now, it's saying stuff like putting in collard greens and putting in um, carrots and things like that. I think I, I say, you know, you can seed for carrots, but the soil temperatures are so warm, they're probably not going to sprout. I mean, then you'll forget about them and then they'll come up like a month from now <laughs> if the birds don't eat the seeds first. Um, I have been putting in quick crops of beans right now because you can get another quick crop of beans um, before it's too hot. Uh, I mean, before it, it gets too cool, uh, because usually people have planted those when, you know, May, June, and they've, you know, a lot of them have died because they've put off a bunch of beans and then they just give out because um, that's just nature. Um, and then you can just pop in another quick, quick crop of beans. Um, some people are, are putting in, you know, um, 
it's too late for tomatoes. You could put in a, a pepper or two if it was a small variety. Um, we're in this weird time where everything is super, super fruitful. Like all the tomatoes are going to start crashing and burning soon. Um, don't get upset if your tomatoes die. They're supposed to if you put them in in May, June. Um, they put off so many tomatoes and then it's just the end of their life. They're an annual. They're very seasonal. Um, so in about a week or two, I'm going to start all of my brassicas inside. So my um, kales, collards, um, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to start inside so that um, so that they sprout at room temperature rather than trying to put them outside and it's too hot so they won't sprout. Um, I'll do that first. And then in, you know, a um, month, six weeks, I can put those in the ground because the day lengths will be shorter. The shadows will start to change. Um, they'll become uh, a little bit longer. The shadows always become longer when we start to move into the fall. Um, and then September is when we really truly kind of change everything over. So uh, a quick crop of beans is what I would, I would pretty much recommend right now in this little weird time where it's just super duper hot. Um, yeah. And then maybe just, you know, replanting some of the stuff like basil, like if you have some plants right now, if you go to any garden center, all the vegetable plants are going to be seriously discounted because it's so hot outside nobody wants to really be planting right now um so you can find a lot of really good deals just be careful of what you're buying because um uh, nurseries a lot of times especially the big box stores are there to make money and just because there's a broccoli plant there now doesn't necessarily mean you should put it in um because the heat stress will cause the cabbage loopers to destroy it so cabbage loopers are those really cute little yellow uh butterflies that you see flying around capture every one of them and squish them because I tell you they're going to lay eggs on anything in the cabbage family which is your kales and brassicas and broccoli and cauliflower and kohlrabi um, and then they're going to loop through and and basically destroy your plant but once it cools down the plant will actually become stronger and will be able to actually fight off um, cabbage loopers better also the life cycle of a cabbage looper will start to um, decline so we're in a weird time. That's interesting. So I did have a comment on this. Um, we had a, someone who said that their carrots did just sprout, but they planted them three weeks ago. Yeah. So that so that's awesome, especially if you have shade in the afternoon. Um, so just make sure they have enough water so they don't get scorched. That's awesome that you had them sprout. Yeah, most definitely. Um, but it doesn't I, work for everybody. People call me all the time, like I put them in two weeks ago, and I don't know what's happening. So, <laughs> But that's great. If they sprouted for you, go for it. Go for it. You might be in a microclimate where you get a little shade in the afternoon or the soil doesn't heat up until the middle of the day or something like that. There's microclimates all over the place. Like for instance, Briggs, we're putting in a new orchard and everybody who comes to Briggs, they'll leave their house at seven in the morning. And when they hit Briggs, they're like, how is it 10 degrees hotter than here? So even though in, um, in Durham, um, it, we're technically zone 7B, but um, we're planting for zone eight, which is warmer because it's warmer at Briggs. It's a microclimate where it's warmer. It warms up really early in the morning because we get that first morning sun. And, um, and also we're only getting it warmer because of climate change. So we're planning to become zone eight because we're almost there as it is. Um, and then you'll have other regions of Durham um, that are maybe even slightly higher, higher elevation with a lot of afternoon shade and they might be a 7A. So, um, you know, just something to kind of pay attention to. Well, I think we are out of time and questions. So um, that's it for, for, for my side of things. <laughs> Great. Well, tune in next week, everybody. I'll see what I can find for you. Maybe we'll do a coconut. I'll figure out how I can do it effectively. I mean, I could just break a coconut in the office, um, but it takes a little work to break down a coconut so you can enjoy a fresh coconut. Um, but I'll see what I can find because if I'm going to show you how to break down a cold, uh, a, a brown coconut, I have to show you how to do the fresh coconut and sort of the difference between those two things. So if I can find both of those things, we'll do coconuts next week. If not, um, I have a bunch of other ideas. So, um, so I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us.